All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, are you able to hear me all right? Okay, yes. thank you. We're trying, yes. We are trying a new meeting format this evening. So if at any point uh, it's difficult to hear us, please uh, let us know via the chat feature and we'll uh, get closer to our speakers and um, try to accommodate for that. So again, thank you all for being here for our work session this evening. Uh, we are recording this work session uh, via Zoom, so if you um, have to drop off at some point or if you know there are others who may want to come back and, and watch and participate, it will be available on the city's website and through our YouTube channel. Just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, I think before we start, we're all getting to be Zoom virtual meeting experts, but one of the things that we would ask is that you would go ahead and mute yourself during the presentation. Uh, that helps us eliminate feedback and background noise and distractions as we're kind of walking through that process. And then um, what we would recommend, we will have a, a presentation that we will screen share with all of you and that we might recommend that during that presentation, if you're comfortable turning off your video as well, it's, we were in a meeting today where we found that to be very um, helpful and not, not so distracting as we were trying to walk through some of the data that was being presented. So if you're comfortable doing that, please feel free. Um, the other thing that I think um, we have a lot of information to cover this evening and we're looking forward to being able to share that with you. Uh, I thought what we would do is just plan now to take a break at approximately 8.30 this evening so that everyone has a chance to get up and take a restroom break, stretch legs, kind of see where we are in terms of the, the volume of material that we've prepared for you this evening uh, and, and think about whether it makes sense or how long it, it might make sense for us to continue. Certainly this is the beginning of an ongoing conversation for us and we want to make sure that everybody is you know, able to stay engaged throughout that process. So we'll kind of touch base, plan to touch base at 8.30 and take a quick break and then hop right back into that. So I wanted to do just again, thank you all for being here. Please that um, you're here to be a part of this conversation with us. My name is Laura Smith. I'm the city administrator with the city of Mission. I've been in uh, with the organization for 15 years and the city administrator for the last five uh, and this community and this organization uh, is, is really outstanding. A place I'm pleased to be um, and, and something I'm absolutely pleased to be a part of. I will say that I have to let you know that I'm sorry that Chief Hadley is not going to be able to join us this evening. He worked alongside all the rest of us that you're going to hear from this evening on pulling these presentation materials together but he had a last minute personal conflict that he was unable to reschedule for this evening. So um, I'm going to introduce you to the two captains who will be uh, doing the lion's share of our presentation this evening. Um, and I'm pleased to do that. First we have Captain Kirk Lane. He is the patrol captain or patrol commander, which means he oversees the patrol officers on the street. Uh, he has been with the City of Mission for the last 18 years and in law enforcement for the last 24 years. Also joining us, we have Captain Dan Madden. He currently serves as the investigations captain. So over our investigation, detective unit, internal affairs investigation, uh, and things along those lines. Dan has a 21-year um, career in law enforcement. All 21 of those years, I'm pleased to say, was the City of Mission. So, there's a lot of law enforcement experience um, that will be brought to the conversation this evening. Uh, and with that, uh, in just a minute, we'll kind of talk about very quickly our goals and objectives for tonight. But I know that Captain Madden uh, has a statement that he would like to share to kind of kick off uh, the presentation tonight. Thank you. Mayor and Council, 
while George Floyd's murder in Minneapolis was a tragedy that sparked worldwide, a worldwide call to action, we understand that there have been injustices in our country happening for centuries, and we, as human beings, must find a way to do better by other human beings. Regardless of any characteristics that differentiate our appearance, our beliefs, our age, or who we choose to love. As we sit here tonight, unrest is occurring coast to coast, including the most recent event in Kenosha, Wisconsin. <clears throat> Bad police officers, no matter what patch and badge they wear, erase years of progress made in communities nationwide. The Mission Police Department relies on fostering good relationships in our community. Good relationships between the police and the public are crucial to maintaining a safe place for people to live, raise families, shop, walk, and drive. We sit before you tonight not fearful or worried about the information we will present or questions you may ask. We sit here tonight excited to move conversations and actions forward in a meaningful way. <clears throat> we, have, we have a profound admiration and understanding that the work you do represents the very people we have vowed to protect and serve. We understand that it is your duty to ask the hard questions, pursue answers, and ensure the work every city employee does reflects the will and approval of the residents and businesses of the city of Mission. This evening we will present a lot of information and data on where we currently stand, along with some historical information. The information we present is not intended to come across as anything other than, other than a starting point for these important issues as government employees and officials must address. We believe we have a strong, well-balanced department, 28 dedicated men and women of various backgrounds. We see and hear the wonderful things police officers do for our community, as well as the mistakes they make. When they do wrong, we hold them accountable. We must. Tonight we sit proud, but not perfect, for police officers too are human beings. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Madden. Uh, I can't really say it much better than that, other than to just try to frame, uh, again, our purpose and our goals and objectives. Uh, the council has been having over the last couple of months conversations around how to tackle some of these issues in our community. And um, I think most of you are aware that they have mapped out a, sort of at least a four-step action plan and as I said, this is really the beginning, so we anticipate that, that once we get these conversations started that they will be ones that continue. So tonight is step one in that multi-phase action plan. Uh, and uh, next Wednesday at our Finance and Administration Committee will be sort of step two. And we'll cover what, the, what those next steps are at the end of the meeting. But I did want to just comment um, that we recognize and want to acknowledge up front that tonight's presentation is going to be very uh, data heavy. So there's a lot of policy language, a lot of statistics, a lot of information that we want and, and feel like we need to share with you. So we're going to try to move through that as quickly as we can. Um, and if we can, if, if you can hold the majority of the questions until we get to the end of the presentation, I think that there may be things that will be answered along the way uh, because of just the breadth of, of the material that we will be covering this evening. If you have a question, uh, please submit it via the chat feature, uh, understanding that, that, that your question will be visible to everyone. Um, and then when we get to kind of our discussion portion, of the meeting and answering questions. Uh, we'll, we'll walk through those. If you would like to ask your question, if you would like to unmute and, and ask your question in that fashion, please just indicate that in the chat box. And that helps us sort of keep the meeting uh, organized because I, I know we have enough participants on, uh, um, on my screen. We, we, can, we can't see everyone um, all the time. So without any sort of further, well, let me just say this. So again, a lot of data, a lot of information. And as Dan said, um, it's not to um, point out that we're perfect, um, but we have to, we, I think we all have to become educated and build some of that foundation about where we are today as we think about where we want to go 
in the future. So as we have questions, the other thing is if we don't get everything covered tonight, if there's something you really want to talk about that is not on this evening's agenda, we'll be maintaining sort of a parking lot for issues that we will make sure to address or incorporate into future meeting agendas. So with that, I think we'll move into screen sharing for the presentation. Again, if you feel comfortable turning off your video, it may be um, less distracting as we move through this presentation. So the agenda was published uh, on the city's website. We've covered welcome and introductions, goals, objectives, and purpose. Uh, for the balance of this evening, our plan is to give you sort of an overview of Lexipol, which is our current uh, policy um, management and administration system, and touch on several of the critical policies uh, that have become focus areas in recent months. Specifically, we've got quite a bit of data to share on our current use of force policy, which is policy 300, its practice. Um, then we'll move into specific use of force data, uh, touch on some other policies of interest or relevance, and finally conclude this evening with information on kind of bias-based statistic tracking. So the purpose of our policies um, is really to provide guidelines for officers to perform duties. So the city has a personnel policy manual and guidelines that apply to all of the employees in the organization, and it's very detailed and covers a lot of ground. Very general personnel subjects. The police department has a standalone policy manual, um, which has 111 currently separate policies. And these are policies that assist offers <clears throat> excuse me, our officers both professionally, legally, ethically, it, it aids in kind of fair uh, and reasonable delivery of law enforcement or public safety services. One thing that I think it's important to acknowledge um, that I think is everyone understands is that policies cannot account for every potential situation. And particularly, they cannot account for every potential situation a police officer might encounter in the field or on the street. But they are incredibly value, valuable in terms of communicating and reinforcing expectations for behavior, um, training, and all those things. So, so policies are, are very important to us. Now I'm going to ask uh, Captain Kirk Lane to uh, start sharing some information about our policy management system and some of our policy specific policies. Thank you, Laura. Good evening. Um, yeah, so let's kind of talk about first, I think it's important is, is policies um, and, and how we went to Lexapol. So back in 2015, um, I brought this idea to the command staff and brought it to Laura. Um, and at that time, what happens with policies of the chiefs that are currently, and at that time we'd had a, a been on our chief number five that just came in. So the chiefs bring their policies with them, so from their departments or wherever they came from. Um, and we were at looking at five different chiefs' policies um, that we were operating off of. So the message was we wanted to be more consistent and and have clear policies for everybody to understand. So we went to Lexapol with that in mind to clean everything up, and I think we accomplished that. So what does Lexapol do? It provides policies rooted in law and best practices, and that's something that that's, we operate by and every department operates by. Uh, Lexapol is created by lawyers, risk managers, and former law enforcement officers. That's a great group of people to mix because not only is the legal part getting covered, but the, the reality of how it's going to work in departments and on the street, that those combine, and that brings everything to the table, and, and it, it makes better policy. Consistently monitors changes in state and federal law, as well as court decisions that impact policies. Prior to Lexapol, we would have to manually enter 
any kind of policy changes into our system and push those out. Now, was it timely? We tried to be as timely as possible, but now we have a, another company that's constantly monitoring that for us and giving those uh, up-to-date changes, and it's as simple as a click of a button. Tracks any kind of changes that are made to the policies. So that can be anywhere from uh, a space to a comma to a capital letter or a whole different change to make that fit your organization. And what I mean by that is your rank structure because not every department is set up the same. So all those changes from the little to the big are all tracked and monitored so we have that. Uh, to show you kind of, kind of how popular Lexical is, it's used by nine different law enforcement agencies here in Johnson County and 49 agencies just throughout the state of Kansas. Um, so here's a great uh, comparison of this one of the most recent changes to the use of force that Lexapol pushed out. So as you can see, what the officer will read on the left-hand side is what the current current policy is, and what to the right is the changes that were made. Um, where you can see that the red was so there were some items struck out, and the new blue words were added, or some changes to. So the other benefit, Lexapol tracks when the officers have signed off and read that policy. When that policy comes into me, it's read, it's verified by me. If it's um, has something to pertain to a different uh, group within the AC, maybe something in investigations, uh, that will go by that commander. He will look at it, make any adjustments that he feels that might need to be made. It will be sent back up to the chief to be approved, and then it's issued out to the officers. Um, so those updates are always put out too. If there's an update, I check the policies weekly. I check the policy manual, and I'm usually given some kind of sign that there's an update that's needed. The other advantage to Alexa polls is the daily training bulletins that are issued that provide constant reinforcement to policy. So when you have problems with policies, it's not just when, when someone will ask, do you have a policy on that? The answer is yes. You issue that you can give that policy and say, yeah, but the biggest problem is when's the last time you trained on that policy? That's what gets you in trouble is you may have the policy, but you never train on it. So it makes that policy irrelevant. But these daily training bulletins is something that makes that a possibility for us. So the daily training bulletins are issued every month. So they come in a bundle of about 30, and they're, they're given scenarios um, with the questions, kind of like a quiz. So the other beauty of that is that they're, they're high risk, low frequency events. So something like the use of force would be a prime example, vehicle pursuits, domestic violence. Some of those would be low frequency events, but you need to train on those even more. So those are more emphasis put on those that, that cause those type of problems. But the policy, the daily training bullets will cover all the areas of the policy. Here's another example of the daily training bullet and just how it comes in the package. It's just the questions. And then there's, there's one of the questions or scenarios, if you will, with the policy underneath that the officer can reference while they're reading that. And again, that's another question. So use of force, um, policy, accountability, reporting, training, and statistics. I do want to talk about this um, in a little bit. Oh, Dave, we're going to go. So do it. And uh, I've been teaching uh, use of force or defensive tactics since 1995. I'm an adjunct instructor at the police academy, a master instructor in hand-to-hand, in -hand, OC, baton, and taser. Um, I've presented at two national academies and two national conferences for training and trainers. I've trained the majority of the officers in some kind of instructor level course uh, in Johnson County, um, all the way out to Miami County. So I'm very passionate about this, and it's a very important uh, to me personally um, that we're out there doing the right thing. So use of force policy 300 is our use of force policy. Um, and people ask that, you know, what policy is that, and, and how do you guys use that? So Reasonable force when warranted. So what does that mean? Um, the officer is allowed to use reasonable force. Well, people get, uh, that's the first question. I'm going to try to beat that to the punch and ask what that 
reasonable force is. And it goes back to a Supreme Court case, Graham versus Connor, a 1989 Supreme Court case. Um, and, the, and the big thing is, is that when you, when you look at uses of force, um, the courts are looking at was it objectively reasonable? And how do you get to that? Um, the court said that the seizure, which is, this is all falls under the Fourth Amendment, which helps a little bit to help you guys have some reference to that. Anytime an officer terminates a free citizen's movement by means of, that are intentionally applied. So anytime that we stop that movement, there's the seizure part, right? And, um, and an officer can seize people in many ways, traffic stops, investigation, uh, investigative detentions, arrests, and all seizures fall under the Fourth Amendment. To see someone, um, the officer can just yell stop, and that person can stop, but that still counts as a seizure. So everything must be objectively reasonable. Was that stop even objectively reasonable? So they also talk about there is no 2020 hindsight to the objective test, which I think is important to bring out. Officers are judged based on the facts that are reasonable that are reasonably known to them at the time. What they learned later is, is not relevant to that situation. The Supreme Court stated that the test for reasonableness under the Fourth Amendment is not capable of precise definition or mechanical application. Allowance must be made for that fact. Police officers are often forced to make split-second judgments in circumstances that are tense, uncertain, and rapidly evolving about the amount of force that is necessary in a particular situation. And obviously there may be more than one way to affect a seizure in a tense, uncertain, and rapidly evolving event. And while one force option may be better than another, all that really matters under the objective test was whether the force was used was reasonable. In short, what would a reasonable officer say? Did the force fall within the range of reasonableness or was it excessive and unconstitutional? And I think that's important to bring up from the fact is that in, in trying to train people in that is, is, is very important. And, and we'll get into that our training here in a little bit later. But this also falls into our language with, with the Kansas law, which is KSA 215227, which says the same thing as the officers are allowed to use their reasonable amount of force to effect an arrest. In this policy, you'll also see that it has include, includes the duty to intercede or intervene and report, which means if officers are seeing any type of excessive force, they have a duty to intervene and report that immediately. It also includes de-escalation, um, and you'll see a lot of the wording in our policies are covered in another policy, just to put, to more, I'm sorry, to put more emphasis on that particular situation or that, that topic. So some of the factors we use to determine reasonableness, and this is in the policy too, the immediacy and severity of the threat. So, and I'm going to try to explain some of these um, as we move forward. The risk and consequences if the suspect escapes. Proximity of weapons to the suspect. The subject effectively restrained, and, and talking about restrained is that if someone was in handcuffs, doesn't necessarily mean they cannot still hurt you or push you. An example of that would be if they were handcuffed and standing on the side of the road, they could uh, push an officer into traffic or if you're standing on the bridge, you can push the officer over the bridge. Um, the seriousness of the suspect, offense, and the contact. So you look at, um, you know, what was reasonable. One of the things that I would, I would tell the recruits is that if you had an a elderly woman who stole a can of cat food valued at 78 cents, and would you use a lot of force on her to, if she resisted arrest um, and she tried to pull away? Um, and then you had the same guy who hit somebody with a baseball bat and, and is the offense there and the seriousness of the crime and the totality of those circumstances were something that the outcome that could possibly happen. Um, and variables are something that comes into play a lot and that's the officer subject factors, eyes, uh, age, size, strength, skill, injuries, um, and this is a good example of that. So. Uh, officer, we have a, a female officer there and another male officer. Obviously, there is a huge size discrepancy between the two, right? And then there's your, yours truly there uh, on the on the right, um, and it's different that way. So you you have that size difference, and with my 
would her amount of force that she'd used have to affect the arrest on the larger person be higher than what mine would be? And that situation will dictate it. And those, and those, they have to have those kind of options when they go into those scenarios. I obviously would not use the same amount of force on, on someone smaller than me or try to avoid that at, at all costs while I'm in that situation. So deadly force applications. Um, so prime example here, when reasonable officers shall make efforts to identify themselves as a police officer and give a warning prior to using deadly force. So a good example of that, um, or work, let's just say an example where they wouldn't do that, um, if you had an active shooter situation. Um, if you have that situation that you have to stop that threat immediately, um, and, or you're getting shot as an officer, I, I'm not going to shout back that I'm going to use deadly force back at them as they're shooting at me. That would be something that wouldn't be reasonable for me to, to yell that back. Um, and deadly force is justified in the following circumstances under imminent threat or imminent risk. So an officer can use deadly force to protect himself or others from what he or she reasonably believes is an imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury. Uh, an officer may use deadly force to stop a fleeing suspect or subject when the officer has probable cause to believe that individual has committed or intends to commit a felony involving um, the infliction or threatened infliction of serious body harm or death, and the officer reasonably believes that there is another imminent risk of serious bodily injury or death to another person if the individual is not immediately apprehended. Under such circumstances, a verbal warning should precede the use of deadly force where feasible. So you see that word reasonably a lot. Um, so having all these things these officers are trained in and, and constantly thinking of, of, is this reasonable? Is this the right thing to do? And an imminent does not mean immediate or instantaneous. It may exist if an officer reasonably believes that the individual has a weapon or attempting to access one and tend to use it against the officer or another person. It may also exist if the individual is capable of causing serious bodily injury or death without a weapon. And that's, again, you could think about all kinds of different scenarios, but again, I'll bring up them being able to push you out into traffic or over a bridge. Um, and the officer has to believe the individual intends to do so. So, use of force to seize evidence. So, this may be a, a good, may use force to lawfully seize evidence and prevent the destruction of evidence. So a good example of that might be if they're trying to throw their drugs away in the gutter. So, trying to grab them from, and stop them from doing that. And here's another one that strikes uh, the eyebrows to raise. Should not intentionally use a technique that restricts blood flow to the head, restricts respiration, or creates likelihood that the blood flow to the head or respiration would be restricted. Where this comes from is back in the early 90s, probably the early 80s, people would try to swallow their drugs. So people would grab their, grab their throat to keep them from swallowing and ingesting whatever narcotics they were. And that ends up causing, can cause damage uh, to their larynx, um, to their throat, or bust the bag that's inside their throat. So in these type of situations, um, we'd immediately notify medical, keep them from moving around, to keep the blood flow going more and more and more, and, and get medical to check them out immediately. But that's why that was put there originally. Uh, shooting at moving vehicles, um, that is something that's another hot topic button. So as you can see in there, uh, when feasible officers should take reasonable steps to move out of the path of an approaching vehicle. Uh, and that's our goal. We do not want to put ourselves in a bad situation or force a bad situation. So trying to get out of the way is what we want to try to do and leave a way for you to get out. Um, an officer should only discharge a firearm at a moving vehicle or its occupants when the officer believes there are no other reasonable means available to avert the imminent threat of the vehicle. So. The best example I could think of that is you've seen some of the attacks in Europe where the people are driving down sidewalks and just running people over. And that would be a situation that the officer would have to justify using that lethal force to stop more death or carnage from happening. And we don't shoot at vehicles to disable or attempt to disable the vehicle. Medical considerations. That's another thing when you see when we get into our use of force uh, defensive action report when an officer uses force. Uh, we always require the officer to seek a medical assistance for any kind of distress or injuries 
when it's safe to do so. So if there was some sort of force used um, and the person complains about anything, we call the ambulance. Let them come and verify and check them out and make sure they're okay. The other thing is if they're complaining about any kind of injuries or anything and there's visual injuries on them, when we get them to the Johnson County Jail, they won't be accepted unless they've been cleared medically to be accepted by a doctor or by the EMS. Um, there's also a note in here too that individuals should not be placed on their stomachs for extended period of time as this could impair their ability to breathe. This was something again that um, been around since the 1990s with excited delirium when that became a big hot topic in law enforcement. Uh, that was something that policies immediately changed and people started looking at um, people having an excited delivery episode. Um, they have a spike body temperature, um, rapid breathing, reacting to whatever narcotic they're on. And if they're down on their stomach for any extended period of times, uh, it can cause difficulty breathing. It has, a big, it has happened several times. It's been documented where they've actually died from, from the asphyxia of just being on their stomach. So at any time an officer uses force, they must complete a defensive action report. So you'll see that that's attached to the uh, use of force report. And we're going to go over that a little bit in depth. So some of the things to point out and explain to you what they mean. Um, and so you can have a better understanding, maybe some cop terminology. Um, so anytime an officer uses force, um, and when I say that, it's anytime they, they do something other than the person complies verbally. Um, and we are probably a lot more strict on reporting use of force um, than some other agencies, but I think the transparency in that is, is important. So. When I say that, it, some departments don't use report force unless the person has been injured in any way or have any seriously uh, serious body bodily injury, um, and we do it for for anything. Um, so mission requires a completion of defense action report anytime action beyond verbal commands is used. So even pointing a taser at someone is considered a use of force. It may not be deployed, or that person may not know that the taser was even pointed at them. Uh, that will still complete a use of force. So when you look at our defensive action report, that's what our, when an officer uses force, this is what they fill out. Um, and I think I'm going to kind of start here with uh, number five, and if you guys can kind of follow along with me. The reason the use of force was necessary. So right there in the very beginning, we're looking at and justifying our use of force. Was it to effect an arrest? Why, why did we use the force? And this spells out all the different options that this particular um, use of force option was. And then there's always the box there other um, if there didn't meet one of these criteria. And again, not being able to plan for everything that the officers see on a daily basis uh, is something important to have in there. Um, and you can see as we go through there, was the subject injured? Who were they transported by? Where did they go? Um, who was the attending physician, the admitting nurse? So all these things are documented and photographed if they have visual injuries. Um, and describe the subject injuries and all that apply. And then it goes into what the, the use of force was. Um, the subject, how many subjects that resisted? Um, was this, this who the supervisor notified? How many other officers were were uh, there? Uh, that also helps when we're looking at body camera video, in car video, of being able to pull those videos and review that. Um, and then at the time of the arrest, was the subject under the influence of alcohol or drugs? Um, and then were they mentally having a mental crisis? Were they mentally impaired by something? And again, other. Um, so let's jump into the levels of resistance and, and talk about that psychological intimidation. This is what the officer is perceiving. Um, this is someone that would have a, uh, a thousand yard stare where they're not complying with any of your verbal commands they're just staring out into to, to nowhere. So they're, they're not really fighting or resisting you, but your presence there is, is not being noticed. Um, then you jump into nonverbal compliance, which is pretty self-explanatory. And that can be either with 
just not answering you at all or uh, giving you a comment in their thoughts about you. Um, passive resistance, and this is something that, that happens in, in, in the way I kind of train that uh, with, the, with the recruits is, is someone just not resisting you but just not helping you, just dead weight. Uh, they're not actively fighting you. They're just kind of not doing anything that, that you want them to do. And then there's passive resistance, which I think most of our resistance falls into, is where they're kind of pulling away. They're just kind of hanging on to things. Um, they're still not actively fighting you. It's just kind of a passive resistance. Um, and then escape resistance, where they are pulling away from you, trying to get away from you, um, and avoid control at all, at all costs but they're still not really trying to hurt you, they're just trying to get away. And it's important that officers recognize that, it's important that we train on that, that it, it, you still have to use force, excuse me, to, to affect that rest, but it's not, they're not actively fighting you, if that makes sense, they're just trying to get away. So it's important that they're recognizing these levels of, and then you get into the active aggression where they're actually trying to hurt you. And, and then the last one is a deadly force where they're trying to kill you. So it's important that officers can explain what they see because that's, that's justifying their actions in the report. How they're seeing this person acting and are they, are they, are they painting a clear picture to, to someone who's got to pick this up and read it that what they're experiencing. So we'll move into the officer's levels of control um, and, I, and I teach this part two at the academy is his officer presence is assumed. You see that at the top of, of number 28. And I, in my opinion, that's where most officers fail when it comes to use of force is their presence at the scene is when they show up and, they, and people feel like they know they are sure what's going on. And officers have really got to make sure when, they, when they're there, they establish the control to keep that scene safe and the people safe that are there. Um, the next thing the officer will do is use verbal, verbal direction. Try to direct those people to what they want them to do. Um, and then move into, um, as, as this person's resisting, these levels of force move forward. Um, so, you know, they have the verbal direction. And, and we'll talk about some of these intermediate weapons when we get down there. But you have empty hand controls and techniques. So maybe it's an escort, what an escort is, it's some kind of wrist lock or joint lock. Um, and then it can move into, to, if they're holding on to something, some strikes to get, hit the arm and hit pressure points to, to have that arm release something. Um, and then you jump into intermediate weapons, which is uh, pepper spray, baton, um, the taser. And all those tools were made, especially the taser and pepper spray, was it, both of those of being hit with both of those multiple times, it's not pleasant, but the, the, the design of that was to reduce the risk of injury to the officer and the subject. So the less that you've got to touch somebody, the better off they're going to be in the long run to reduce the amount of injury. If we have to go hands-on with people all the time, whether it's just wrestling around to get them under control, there's a probability of injury, not only to the officer, but to the subject. So those are things that are important to, to point out of what those tools are and what they're made. And the officer has to justify when they use those tools and what, they, what force they were feeling against them as they, as they elevated to that, to that direction. And then you've got lethal force. And of course, that's any type of, of force that can cause great bodily harm or death. And we go in and talk about the restraint methods. Um, and again, it's the reporting officer that writes it, and then the supervisor is going to approve that. And as you flip that to the, the second page of this, it talks about some of the pressure points um, that are on the body that the officers may have struck, so they use the correct verbiage. Um, it even talks about where you hit them with the pepper spray, where you may have hit them with a taser or a less lethal uh, beanbag gun. Um, but those marks need to be indicated on here and pictures taken and the follow-up of that. Um, and and this, is, this all goes at any time an officer uses force. So the use of force reporting and accountability. So, you know, we are not a large city, but um, typically when there is a use of force that happens, it would, it, the supervisor is notified and he or she will respond to that location if they're available or not tied up on a call. Um, and 
those those use of forces can the officer the supervisor may not always be there but will be there at one point in the in the process to, to help oversee and to question what what it, what had happened um, so the supervisor investigates that incident in fact they're required once they review that to send me uh, we'll kind of go through that process a memo of what they viewed and how they thought the process went so Supervisor completes an investigation, sends me a memo, which I'm the patrol commander. Uh, I review the incident and make sure that you know we're within policy, um, identify training issues, equipment needs, or any policy revisions or recommendations. So a lot of times with with these types of, I'm looking for what can we do better? What are we using on a regular basis? Are we doing a lot of stand-up handcuffing? Uh, are we handcuffing people outside the vehicles, and, and do we need to train on that more? Are we proficient in it? Do we look like we're doing it in an effective way? So those are the things that I want to make sure that we're doing and see if we need to go back and train on those again. Um, and if we need to, any equipment needs, do we need to change some stuff to be, to be more efficient? Um, and at any point in the process, an internal affairs investigation can be commenced if necessary. So if that use of force or that issue was found not to be in policy, it immediately goes through internal affairs and we start an investigation. So, use of force training. Um, officers participate in regular defense or tactics classes, um, customized around topics and tactics identified through uh, the use of force data and other factors. Um, so, again, pulling from what we have seen in video and how we're reacting on the street. Um, and I, re I rely on the officers also. Um, we have a, a nice, uh, culture of open discussion about, hey, you know, I didn't find this effective or it was really challenging for me, so we need to work on that or we need to find something else that's effective um, and work on those techniques to get those officers the confidence they need and the proficiency and the skills to do their job safely. Um, firearms training simulator, it's called a fast machine. There's also a machine, it's called the, the Milo machine. So one of the biggest things that, that officers have to do is split second decision making. So again, not being able to train for every scenario, um, we try to, to take advantage of whatever technology we can. Annually, the officers will go up to the Regional Police Academy where they have updated the machine time and time again uh, to a new, it's almost like a, a real life video game. It's a 180 degree screen and it throws you into different scenarios. An important thing here is not to say, Every scenario is not a shoot scenario. We're looking at the officer's ability to de-escalate the situation with, with, their, with their words, with a different tool, and maybe just keep that scenario as calm as possible. And the, as you're going through those scenarios, the instructors are, have the ability to make that scenario more intense, make them react to whatever kind of stimulus the officer's uh, giving that suspect, and we want to challenge the officer every time, but make sure we're walking away with a learning situation, that they came away better, they learned something about it, and that every situation is different, that you can train to that. Um, so again, scenarios may focus on de-escalation training, so the officers can use good verbal and non-verbal de-escalation techniques. Um, officers are coached by the instructors. Um, was that appropriate? Did you use the right amount of force? And there's immediate feedback or correction if it's needed, um, and, and that officer has that feedback and that idea right then and there. And in a real life scenario, you don't have that and people can get hurt. And we build, our ability to train on this on a constant basis is very important. Before we move into the use of force statistics, uh, I think one thing that I would ask Captain Lane to also share with you is um, not only do we require and review use of force reports, um, but our supervisors, there's an expectation of our supervisors to review video footage, body camera footage on a regular basis so, so that um, they understand routinely the behavior that is occurring in the field. So if you wouldn't mind touching. Sure, on. sure. So part of our just our um, everyday has nothing to do with our, our use of force, it's more or less quality control. Um, I ask the supervisors to review three to five videos of each officer every month, random videos that they choose to make sure, hey, our, how's our customer service? How are we doing out there relating to our, talking to our, our citizens? Um, if there are uses of force, are, are we doing the right thing? 
Um, is our officer safety good? So these things are all going in the officer's evaluation. Um, and, and when we do their annual evaluation, we're, we're looking at that. So they're getting random video pulled. They know that they're, they're going to be supervised and watched. And, and we're constantly checking on, on how we're doing out there. And it's just not for use of force. It's just, again, uh, just the quality control of how, how are we doing out there and dealing with our public? How are we communicating? And again, one, one other thing, Captain Madden, I know that in our meeting next week, we're going to be talking more specifically about officer accountability and the mechanisms both within our organization and at, at other levels um, to account for that. But I know that Captain Lane touched on um, you know, an, an internal affairs investigation being started. Could you, could you just briefly share in the context of our conversation this evening what that means and then um, how that is recorded in an, in an officer's file. Sure. Uh, when an officer uses force and, and the preliminary investigation would lend itself that there's some question about the legitimacy of the, or, or possibility of excessive force, an internal affairs investigation commences, that starts essentially a, a, an investigation specific to that incident. Uh, video footage is and it's, hand, and it's handled completely separate from the criminal investigation that was being investigated at the time. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that, which, which I will get into a lot more uh, next Wednesday. Uh, but a lot of it has to do with personnel issues and things that if, if we're compelling an officer to make a statement, then there's implications to that in a criminal court because you don't have, you know, you, you don't have to incriminate yourself for a criminal court proceeding. So there's nuances like that. Those uh, go through the entire event, uh, interview all the officers, any witnesses, and the person that was injured uh, to try to gather the entire, the, the totality of the circumstances to make the determination of whether uh, policy was or was not violated. Uh, at that point, that's when, if, if it's determined that an officer violated the policy, uh, you have to look at then violated the policy to, to a point where it's now a criminal investigation, or was it just a mistake or an error in, in judgment that didn't rise to the level of a criminal inquiry, but still needs to be addressed through the disciplinary process? Thank you. So now uh, we're going to take just a few minutes. Um, and I'll do a quick overview, and I won't do it justice, so I'll ask the captains to, to help me. But um, what we wanted to do was kind of move into the actual use of force statistics and data for our department. Um, and I will lead by saying that we don't have specific records that have been kept since the department's creation, but with the history uh, and tenure of the staff that we have, uh, we can say that at least over the past 25 years in mission, the police department has not used force that led to anyone's death or serious injury. And in the past 20 years, officers have only discharged firearms twice in the course of duty. They, um, once was a shot fired at a vehicle after it attempted to run over an officer. Uh, it did not violate policy at the time, but that would be a violation of our policy currently. And then, most recently, an uh, officer shot and wounded an individual who was shooting into Highlands Elementary School and subsequently came out of his home and pointed a weapon at the officer. So before we, we start specifically looking at um, some of the data and statistics by, by year, and we're going to go back over a three-year period, um, the use of force policy uh, has a requirement that use of force statistics and data are reviewed annually by the chief of police. And those haven't been kept in a consistent format year over year. That's something that as we've moved into this conversation, 
we're modifying. Um, so the best data that we have uh, takes a look back to um, 2017. But before we get into that specific data, uh, we, I think it's important just to kind of take a look at our demographics and the information on the screen and in your packet is, was taken from census data, but it just will break down uh, sort of the, the um, racial makeup of our community and the demographic makeup of the city of Mission. Now, what's um, important to note is that the census data is not a perfect measuring stick. It's a good place to start, uh, but when we think about other factors that influence the demographics of who is traveling in and around our community at any given time, it's important to remember that we are part of a larger metropolitan area. We're not an island unto ourselves. Um, we have three major thoroughfares between Shawnee Mission Parkway, Johnson Drive, and I-35 that either go through or uh, touch our community. And we have a number of destination locations that are specific draws, bringing people uh, who live out and work outside of Mission into our community, whether that be high vs Target, the Department of Motor Vehicles, the Johnson County offices where vehicles are licensed and mental health and public health services are, uh, are provided. So those are all things um, as we look at and, uh, and evaluate and analyze um, that we try to keep in mind um, in addition to what are our baseline demographics. So that kind of, oh, no, I'll cover just quickly. Here we have a summary, and then Captain Lane will cover um, kind of a little more detail each year. Uh, so what we're showing here is data from 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2020 year to date. And we've broken it down to show you the total number of calls or times that we've responded or had contact with individuals. Um, and over the 2017 to 2019, that total call average was about 18,009. And we've broken down the total use of force incidents. So the, the total number of time that we have used force of any type uh, in those contacts, and you will see um, that the average over that three-year period is 23. And when we look at that as a percentage of calls where force was used, um, you can see that those uh, by year and then the average there. Now you will see in 2020 year to date, the numbers are already even just halfway through the year much higher. And that is the result of a switch to um, using CAD, <coughs> excuse me, CAD data. And Captain Lane can, can do a better job of explaining that here uh, in just a moment. But you can see it, at least over the three years that we've been able to provide here, uh, some fairly um, significant consistency in the statistics. So now we're going to take a look at each of those three years on an individual basis. Okay, thank you, Laura. Yeah, that is, I want to try to explain some of this because it's. Uh, some and then I can use that video. I'm sorry, I was just asking. Oh, if you could yep. I can. I think everybody can see me now. Okay, sorry about that. Um, thank you, Laura. Yeah, this is something I, I want to explain some of the techniques when we break it out. When I looked at this, and we kind of just break out, and the first one you'll see there is muscling. It was used 26% of the time, or six times. And muscling is just more or less wrestling. Um, there wasn't a technique specifically used, they just kind of wrestled around and went down on the ground. Um, so I have to classify it, we have to classify it as something. Um, and that's, again, something that we look at, excuse me, from a training standpoint of, is there a technique we could have used instead of just maybe a bear hug or something like that that we, we hung on to that person. So muscling is just more or less wrestling around. Pointing a firearm, um, arm bar. Arm bar is a technique that's taught. Um, it's more of a joint lock and a wrist lock. Um, but someone's taken down to the ground. Strikes would be like a punch um, or a kick. Um, pointing the taser, just pointing it at them uh, is a use of force. Deployment of the taser is another use of force. Uh, OC sprays means that person was sprayed with pepper spray. Uh, 
less lethal, which would be the would, would be the beanbag shotgun that we have. Uh, we had none of those. The baton, baton strikes, we had none of those. So you see a total of 23 times uh, we used force in, in 2017. 17 males, five females, one was unknown. Uh, I'll, and I will kind of explain that to you. Well, like, did you not know? Well, when, if we go outside another city and assist, and we use force in that city, we're still required to do a use of force. And, you know, I'll give an example of a felony car stop where they're, they're getting a subject out of the car. Our officers are over on the, on the side providing cover for the officers who are doing it. Um, again, that's, that person doesn't even know we're, we're aiming a firearm at them or, or what's going on, but we're still reporting that use of force um, because that's, that's what happened. Uh, and you can see uh, the breakdown uh, over there with 70% uh, or uh, 16 uh, total were white, six black, 26%, and again, 1% unknown. Um, but I wanted to explain some of the techniques used, and, and they may be different on, on each slide, but going over that again, that, that total calls uh, and contacts that year were 19,405 and it was 0.12 percent force was used. And as Laura had mentioned, we're looking at better ways to track this all together and looking and open to new ideas of trying to make this more efficient. Right now, the, the, the global picture of when you see a mission officer, whether it's a traffic stop or call for service, the total amount of contacts that we have in here, what is the chance force is going to be used in those situations? And, and that was the totality of of those. So again, 2018, 17,000, 0.14 percent. I'm not seeing anything um, outside uh, of what I've already went over of the techniques. Um, 2019, switch over. Um, again, you see muscling again, um, pointing the firearm, uh, a, a taser deployment, and again, we're at 22. Total for the year 17,624, and of course was used 0.12% of the time. 16 white, 6 black, 0 unknown, 14 male, 8 female. Captain Lane, uh, could you comment? Because I know we just on a previous slide indicated that we did discharge a firearm in 2019. So can you talk briefly about why that is not reported sure, on the chart? Or sure. Or Captain Madden can. Sure. Uh, one of the reasons why that's not on there is because anytime we use deadly force against somebody, it automatically becomes an internal affairs investigation. Uh, not, ju not just internal with us, but it's also investigated by the Johnson County Officer Involved Shooting Team uh, that, is, that essentially takes over the entirety of the investigation in conjunction with the District Attorney's Office. Uh, so. It was a use of force, but due to the nature of it being a deadly force encounter, even though the suspect did not die, we take the initiative to go ahead and do the internal affairs investigation due to the severity of the use of force. Thank you. So moving on, I think, did we just cover 19? Yep, 19, you're good. Okay, so 2020. Doing that, so we're not obviously finished with the year yet. And I will say that when reviewing use of force, we do get more use of forces in the warmer months or the summer months opposed to winter, and that's just simply more people being out, more contacts, etc. cetera. Um, again, nothing on the 2020 data until we get down to the total calls for service. So as Laura mentioned, um, we were pulling um, a lot of the numbers from the 17, 18, and 19 data from computer animated dispatch, which is CAD. Um, and now we've got new data, a new tracking software that has incorporates our reporting system um, and gives more uh, robust um, stats for us to track. And, and we're, again, learning what's the best software, what's the best way to report. And we're, we're working through that process now. But that's why you see a significant increase in total calls. And when I say total calls, those are total calls, total traffic stops, total contacts with the public. So that's why that is so high um, compared to the other stats. And again, it's a different software tracking system. 
So the numbers look different. And again, we're looking and working towards finding the best way to, to track this information and report it. Okay, I think Captain Madden, you want to cover some of the other sort of relevant policies? Yes. So the first policy I want to touch on is the standard of conduct policy. So as Laura said at the beginning, we have a city of mission personnel policy guidelines that, that everyone in the city is responsible for. We have this additional uh, guidelines that we use in our policy book to dictate how we do our job specifically. Uh, so the standard of conduct policy would include some of the similar things that are in a city personnel manual. It also includes things that have to do with ethics, whether it's on or off duty. So we hold our officers accountable for their actions, whether they're on the clock or not. It's important that we maintain a, a private life that's, that's unsullied as, as well as, as our public life. So we do, go, we do hold our officers accountable for their conduct when they're not working as well. Uh, so it includes things like that. But it also has a reinforcement to the duty to intervene, duty to intervene information that we have in both the use of force policy and our crisis, incident, crisis, uh, crisis intervention incident policy. So we're constantly reinforcing the important details that we want people to grab a hold of and, and know inside and out. Uh, throughout our policies. Um, this, and we're, we're going to talk about the bias-based policing policy and laws and things like that uh, here in a few minutes, but it also, our standards of conduct policy also reinforces those uh, anti-discrimination and, and oppression types of things. So if, if you're found to be violating one policy, you're also violating this policy. Uh, and like I said, it's just to reinforce, and when you talk about mixing that in with the daily training bulletins that we do, it's a constant reminder of do your job well, uh, and, and people, re repetition is the best way to learn, in my case anyway. Uh, so uh, the more I see it, the more I'm going to remember it, and, and can continue to, uh, to follow it and, and do the right thing. Um, the other another policy that I wanted to talk about is the crisis intervention incident policy, and it's policy 409. So we have a significant number of calls that involve uh, persons in crisis. Um, we want to make sure that we have a policy that tells our officers how to handle those issues, uh, things that they should and should not do, uh, as far as to not yeah, not, you know, not raise their voice to a person that they, that's potentially a person in crisis, to, to recognize what those factors may be. Uh, we have nearly every one of our patrol officers is crisis intervention team certified. That's uh, something that we felt is very important. Uh, in addition to that, uh, like as I said before, it, it reinforces the de-escalation technique. And, and to Captain Lane's credit, uh, as, as the information after George Floyd's death unfolded, he took the initiative to, in, to go ahead and include those de-escalation techniques in our use of force policy before it was added in Lexapol. So if you've reviewed that use of force policy, you'll notice that there are two different sections that talk about de-escalation. And that's because, and, and we felt the need to keep both in there because it's very specific as far as the guidelines about things to consider uh, in the language and the crisis intervention, intervention policy. So those are things that we're constantly looking at. And that's another thing with Wixlet to say. It's not just they're looking at the laws and, and court decisions and things like that. They're also human beings living in this world right now, seeing everything that's going on and realize that we may need to make some changes. So they're adding those changes in as well. 
uh, another important part of the crisis intervention, uh, for those of you who don't know, is that we partner with, we partner with Johnson County Mental Health uh, and some other cities have a co-responder. That's a mental health uh, employee that, that uh, specializes in, in dealing with persons in crisis. So in 2019, our co-responder responded to 28 active incidents of persons in crisis in the city of Mission. In 2020, it's 16 year to date. But the other thing that is important in those numbers is what that doesn't account for are that in 2019, we also submitted 215 other cases for, the, for Johnson County Mental Health to review and make a determination of services were needed. And so far through June of this year, we have submitted 100. So we're not just, you know, obviously the co-responder can't work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So there are times that we do deal with those, those persons in crisis alone. And we have the resources and there's crisis lines and things that, that we have to help us through those situations. Uh, but we also submit those cases to our co-responders so they can follow up with those individuals to see if they are in need of services through the county. Uh, another policy that we have, it has to do with the public reporting of law enforcement activity. That, that has been in the spotlight some lately uh, with people uh, with First Amendment issues. Um, and our policy has, and it's been before, before um, the issues that have, that have arisen in the last several months, is that we will not prohibit or intentionally interfere with recording of our officers. Uh, we don't mind it. We, we have cameras on ourselves, and that's often the answer. Is, hey, I'm recording this too. You know, so it, it's not a big deal to us. It, 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 we don't mind when people do that. It, we have nothing to hide. Um, and if there is something to hide, then we want to see that video. So uh, those recordings, they can be made anywhere that a person has the right to be, essentially. The only caveat to that is it can't interfere with whatever activity it is that we're working on. So if I am attempting to take an individual into custody and somebody comes up with and puts a camera right in my face that is, is in the, you know, in my eyes, I can't see what I'm trying to do safely. So those things that we always have to be mindful of. So, but for the, but other than those types of situations, which I, can't think of any. I know, you know we, we have uh, people that come around the area from time to time that, that try to bait officers into saying stupid things that they shouldn't say to somebody on camera. Uh, that's just kind of what they do. But, you know, I think that's happened to us recently, and I think our officers do a fine job. And so they don't really mind, they don't really mind those things. Okay, I'm going to pause before we move into the eight can't wait recap because I think we had a couple of questions that we can answer um, very quickly. One, I think the first question that came through the chat feature was whether our use of force uh, statistics that we were reviewing included any time our officers used force in another jurisdiction or when assisting another agency. And, and the answer to that is no, those are specific to incidents within the city of Mission. Correct? Well, we, we do not track if they're in our city or outside of our city. Uh, we haven't been tracking that. I know in the use of force, what we're doing is looking at the use of force. If they're outside of the city, they still do one. Oh, so, so yes, it does include it. Yes, right? yes. yes, yes. I'm sorry. sorry. I, I misunderstood the question. No. Yeah, so it, we do track if, it, if even if they use force outside of our city, that is they it required to use force. And I think the second question, which I can't see, let me find this. How are non-black BIPOC coded in the use of force data? So you, you don't see on that defensive action report, you won't see um, a, a box to check there. Um, and I, but that information and data is collected on our arrest and uh, offense reports, according to what is on that individual's driver's license. 
So over the last three years, um, what has been captured is there's just not been another um, classification that has been involved in a use of, of force incident. So, so those are captured and could be tracked. Um, just didn't apply to those three years worth of statistics. Okay, so um, it can't wait to recap. We won't spend a lot of time on this, but I know following um, George Floyd's death, uh, one of the things that the Johnson County uh, NAACP put out was a call for action to the law enforcement agencies in our county. And one of those included a summary of how our current agency policies and practices align with the eight candidate initiatives. So uh, we responded to that. That um, information was posted on our city website several months ago and is currently available. Um, I think we have covered a, a number of um, the components and the specific uh, points of eight can't wait, so we aren't going to go back and do that, certainly as we get into the questions and discussions. If there's a specific provision of the eight, eight can't wait that you have more questions about, we can come back and answer those. Uh, and again, just with our other policies, we will continue to review and revisit and adjust as necessary. Right. I'm going to talk about the five safe issues that we have um, and, and the policies and laws that pertain to it, as well as the training staff and what, you know, what we're looking at for, for future reporting. Um, it's important to realize I mean, we don't allow bias-based policing. Um, it's, it's against our policy. It's against our law. Uh, based on, on, those, on those protected characteristics and, uh, and, and other statuses that are, that are listed. Um, as, as Captain Lane mentioned before, his supervisors uh, periodically and, and randomly pull videos from every officer. We are fortunate that we have both in-car and body camera systems uh, that allow us to, to view those things, to make sure that we are doing the right thing. So when they're looking at those videos, they're looking to see if there are any suspicions of bias that, that are happening in that interaction, but, uh, along with other things. So, I mean, they're also looking for other things, you know, is the officer um, using, is, he, are, is the officer professional? Are they following policy? And, and are, they, are they using appropriate safety measures to make sure that they keep themselves safe as well? So, so they periodically review that data. We do keep the data. Uh, and, and manage it uh, by officer, but that information isn't anything, that information by itself is, is personnel related, so the cumulative numbers are what, what we report. Um, but we don't, we're not required by the state to collect the data off of a traffic, off of our stop data, um, but we have done so for, for many, many years. Um, and the other thing important about the data that we do collect it's only collected for discretionary context. So your traffic stops, pedestrian checks, uh, suspicious vehicles, things that, that officers kind of choose to do. We don't want to collect all of that data for um, you know, every call that we get to a specific business uh, or every report that we make because that, those aren't things that we control. We want to monitor the data for the things that we can control. And like I said, our policy does specifically, unequivocally prohibit the use of protected characteristics. Um, getting ready for the next slide. Um, and when you talk about the law, our, our policy mirrors, mirrors the state law. Um, and those are found in those statutes listed in the presentation, also prohibits the racial or other bias-based policing. 
Those laws also require every law enforcement officer to receive training relevant to racial or other bias-based policing at least annually. Um, and with that, we have to submit a report to the Kansas Attorney General every year that, that asks us all these a number of questions to say whether we have fallen in line with the law, um, including, and they also want to know if we've had any complaints that are that are bias-based complaints. So, if if we have any bias-based complaints, and we haven't for several years, uh, we have to report those directly to the state, and they decide if they want to do an, another investigation themselves. Uh, another thing to remember is that people can people can report bias-based complaints directly to the attorney general's office, and that that link is um, or it's the Kansas Attorney General. Um, that link is I don't know if it's to the reports or to the office, but uh, you can find a lot of information and historical data from that website about what. Uh, by state complaints have been levied against police departments. Uh, another thing, uh, another thing to remember is that we're going to talk about Kansas C Post. It's the commission, the police officers standards, or the peace officers standards and training commission in Kansas, and that every police officer in the state of Kansas has a certification through that organization, state organization. Uh, you have to meet certain guidelines to be able to, to be eligible to be a police officer in the state of Kansas. Um, and they control what happens to your certification. So if a bias-based complaint, uh, complaint is substantiated, that is, that is uh, submitted to Kansas CPOST and they can investigate that, and that can lead to uh, an officer's certification, a censure. Uh, they can suspend certain police officer certification, and they can also revoke police officer certification. And we're going to get a lot more in depth into C Post's role in hiring and firing or end of career issues. Um, Next Wednesday, but they have they have the ability and the staff and investigators and legal team that looks at all of these reports to see if there's something that needs to be done to keep a bad police officer from this profession. So when you look at our Statistics. So these, these statistics are for a 12-month period for the last 12, 12 months, seven, uh, July of 2019 through July of 2020. So when you look at that, the vast majority of the probable cause that the officer had to make contact with an individual on those discretionary stops is a traffic stop. So that's 97% of our discretionary contacts were on a traffic stop. Um, of those in that year period, 19% uh, were black, 78% were white, 1% Hispanic, and 2% Asian. And when you look at the gender breakdown, it's 41% female, 59% male. Um, the disposition of those contacts, 63% received citation, 32% received warning. 2% uh, were arrested, and 3% is what HBO is our abbreviation for handled by officers. So, no, it could have been um, something that somebody just had uh, a, a car stop that uh, you know, they just heard on the radio that another city had a theft that occurred from the one type of vehicle. They see that type of vehicle, and, and they they try to make sure that it matches up with everything, and they stop it to see, and then they, they just are released. So that would, those would be the types of situations that would be in HBO, along with this other general contacts, uh, especially on pedestrian checks. 
I would jump in before we look at the 10-year history and just say one of the things that we have um, been discussing and are making some modifications uh, to as we've, as we've gone back and looked at the statistics and looked at the data that we've collected is trying to take a look at um, getting a little bit more granular in terms of applying the, the right lens to this. So in the probable cause category, trying to break down particularly pedestrian checks. Uh, traffic, traffic stops, sometimes it's difficult to identify um, who the person is. Um, but on pedestrian checks, we want to look specifically at, um, you know, what is, what is the breakdown with respect to raids in, within that category of a probable cause stop. And then as well, I think, in looking at the disposition of the cases, trying to look at what is that breakout as it applies to who, uh, who may have received a citation versus who may have received a warning for arrest in that same time period. So as, as we continue to collect and evaluate this data, um, you'll start to see uh, some additional categories and, and things that we'll be bringing. So then this, is, this would be the breakdown for, for the last 10 years, or April 2010 to July 2020. So as you can see in these, the numbers are, are remain uh, fairly consistent with the probable cause uh, over the last 10 years. 80% uh, of the persons that we've had uh, encounters with on discretionary stops are white, 15% black, 3% Hispanic, 2% Asian, and then that's 60% male, 40% female. And then you can see the, the disposition data as well. Um, that, that remain fairly, fairly constant throughout those 10 years. Can you talk about tracking by officer? And, and we have, I mentioned a little bit before, but we do track this data by specific officer, uh, look at it, analyze it, um, and, and try to make sure that there are no trends, that there are no issues that that come kind of, that spark our interest, and and we we do that in a number of different areas besides the bias-based policing. You know, if, if one particular officer has an exorbitant number of uses of force compared to other officers, we, it raises a flag to us. We we need to investigate. There may be a you know a completely legitimate reason uh, for that occurring, but it could be that. that there's a problem brewing that we need to get a hold of and retrain and work with uh, those officers that are showing signs of going down a bad a bad road to pull them back, get them retrained, see where they're at emotionally, and make sure that they are fit to be a police officer. Uh, but we so we are looking at a wide variety of data uh, to kind of give us that warning system uh, to assure that we're putting good, healthy, appropriate police officers out serving the city of Mission. Okay. You've been very gracious in listening to us for the last almost hour and a half. And so now uh, we've had a few other questions. I've had some come in from council members. So I've asked the council members with questions uh, to please, if you will, unmute yourselves and go ahead and ask those questions. And then, again, if there's anyone, uh, a member of the public that would like to submit a question, either via the chat feature or uh, to, to unmute yourself, um, let us know if you, if you would like to speak um, in the chat box, and then we can specifically call on you. So, Council Member Flora. Yes, uh, thank you. I, I really appreciate appreciate the presentation. Lots of good information. Um, I know you said we weren't going to deep dive into the eight can't wait responses, but I did have one quick question on that. 
Um, it's been a while since I looked at them, but I believe that our responses indicated that we don't use chokeholds or that we have a policy banning chokeholds, but I didn't see that in the policies shared tonight, um, other than arguably in the section about evidence seizure specifically that talks about uh, not using um, pressure on the neck or something like that. So I was just wondering if our officers could speak to that point. Sure. Uh, I guess I need to unmute myself. Okay. No, no one unmute. Okay. So you got me, right? Great question. So it is not in our policy that we teach that, we or do we train in that? Um, so part of this, and 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 there's a there's a couple things I think need to be explained with that. Um, so a strangle, and I'm sorry, strangle hold or choke hold. So We've never trained in my time of law enforcement trained in, in chokeholds or strangleholds. Um, what we trained in in the neck restraint area, uh, and we don't train that here, is uh, carotid neck restraints. So a chokehold or a stranglehold would be something to restrict the airway, right? So that would be something for us immediately would be lethal force. Carotid neck restraints, so there's many classes, there's lots of training out there for that. Um, and uh, there's specific certifications for it. But we don't train in that either. Um, we look at those type of options to be a lethal force option. So there has been discussions and we have talked um, and we continue talking about it. Um, but that would be something that would be justified at a lethal force situation for us and to put in that we um, don't do it. Um, I mean, we don't try it. You'd have to be trained on it to do it. We don't even train it. And I don't have any options um, that we train for, for lethal force other than firearms training. We don't train our officers to, uh, to, to use lethal force with their hands. Um, and that would be just like you wouldn't train someone. We don't train people to stab people in the, in the, in the eyes with the pens. But when they're at a lethal force situation, they may not have a choice of what they're trying to do to save their life or save someone else's life. Does that kind of answer that a little bit? I think so. I guess I have one question, um, follow up related to the training point then. So is it somewhere our policy that unless it is a deadly force situation, our officers should not be using techniques that they are not specifically trained in? We don't, we, 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 it's a good question. Uh, so we don't, unless it's lethal force, um, they can use unconventional techniques if it's a lethal force situation. Does that make sense? And I'd have to. So only, in, only in lethal force situations. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I think we had another just sort of clarification in the chat box. So before we move on to this, no, we do not explicitly ban that in our chokeholds and strangleholds in our current policy. So I think that answered a, a question that, that had been submitted. Uh, Councilmember Davis. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask if you could just review the chain of command and also explain in a situation where you're re to report to a supervisor if you use if you have to intercede or anything like that uh, in use of force, what happens if it's the supervisor that you're having to intercede with regards to use of force? Good question. So the chain of command is the way our department's set up is you have an officer, you have a corporal, you have a sergeant, you have a captain, and then the chief of police. So um, our officers typically on the street can be with a corporal or a sergeant at any time. Um, in the chain of command, if the situation, and, and this doesn't even have to be with the use of force, if there is an issue that is brought up um, and it's with your direct supervisor, you have the authority to go right above him or her to address that situation and that's encouraged. Um, in a department our size, um, it is, uh, it's not, it's never been a problem since I've been here and it, it's been a very open group uh, to have those type of discussions. but. It's encouraged for the, the men and women of the agency. If you have a problem with your supervisor, you absolutely can go to the rank above and, and, and address that situation. 
I have another question. I went to the uh, website for the state and looked at the most recent uh, submitted report on um, on the police bias uh, report. And it indicates that there are two questions that we answer no to. And one is, does the agency have a racial or other bias-based policing community advisory board? We answer no. And we also have, does the agency have racial or other bias-based policing comprehensive plan? And the answer is no. Can you talk to those uh, two questions and how they were answered? Sure. So in a statute that follows the racial bias-based policing laws, I believe it's 22-4610, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, it, it talks about cities can enact those things to incorporate into their police department. So at this time, we don't have those, we don't have those things in place currently. And I know for next week's discussion, that will be one of the topics that, that we bring up. Uh, but since we don't have them in place, then the answer to those questions would be or no. Captain Madden, does that mean that, uh, do you have any sense of the other cities in the area and whether they do have those? advisory boards or comprehensive plans? Um, some of the some of the larger cities in the county have some advisory boards um, and I'm not sure about the compre comprehensive planning uh, but I know some do have advisory boards with different levels of um, involvement in in those on those processes. Uh, some are strictly to review bias-based policing complaints. Uh, and, and to make sure that there's an objective uh, eye looking at looking at those types of complaints. So, um, you know, a lot of the larger agencies that, that tend to have more, you know, I guess it's just a volume issue. If you larger agencies are going to have more complaints, um, we haven't had any in. I think 2015 was the last we had two that year, and. So it was last year we had a report that we had any uh, that were specific to specific complaints about uh, bias. Uh, so uh, as we move into the conversations next week, you know, we'll have a lot more detail about what different agencies do and what the roles of boards are in those cities. Thank you. We've been in quite a few conversations, as Captain Madden referenced, and. Um, Big cities, certainly the larger communities here in the county and throughout the metro, but some of the smaller cities have things. And so it's, we're trying to just sort of gather all the information about purpose and, and goals and effectiveness um, so that as we move through that conversation, we can make some decisions for our future going forward. I know Council Member Thomas had a question about uh, whether we've had any bias-based complaints. And I think Captain Madden just answered your question it, by his report that it was 2015, that was the last time we had that. Is that fair, Council Member? That is fair. Thank you, Captain Madden and Laura, for answering the question. Okay, I think uh, Council Member Goldinghouse. Thanks. Uh, and thanks, Captain Lane and Captain Madden. This has been a really uh, illuminating conversation. I had questions going back to the defensive action report, and I wanted to know, I, you had kind of mentioned we, we kind of brought in the question about body cameras when the use of force was being done. Is that a one-to-one -one ratio where every time a defensive action report is filed, the body camera footage is reviewed? Yeah, good question. Yeah, so anytime there's a use of force, we're pulling video not only from the officer that used the force, but the other officers there to get to all the angles that we can. Um, anytime in the in-car camera. So we're looking at any kind of footage that we can get our hands on. The officer is supposed to also report that, of who else was there, what units were there. So we can review all that footage and all the different angles that are involved in that footage because you can see things different from not only the officer's point of view, but the other officers that were responding's point of view. That is also looked at and watched on every use of force report and every vehicle pursuit. 
Thank you. Um, I, I did have a quick follow up, I guess, to that extent. You know, is it common? And I guess it can even be kind of anecdotal in your experience. Is it common that details filed in the defensive action reports ever conflict with maybe a supervisor's review or a, um, a, a another eye looking at it? Or do most of those times do, do the details line up between all the? Uh, well, being completely trans, good question. Being completely transparent with you, Trent. Reviewing those since I've been here, I've I've seen two use of forces. So when the use of force. I check a box and put it was within department policy, out of department policy, and other. Okay, so everybody's like, well, what's other? It's either in or out. Well, other is is that it can be in policy, but a better way to do it. I've had that happen two times since I've been here. Um, and, and looking at those events, we, we look at that situation and say, you know what, that was justified, but there was a better way to do that and maybe a safer way to do that for you. Right, so we're looking at those, and, and but those are um, the, the supervisor will check that or write in his memo that that was uh, it would fall within policy. Well, it did, but it's not that transparent to me that I was completely comfortable with that particular technique. So I think we could have done a better job or used a different technique um, in that situation. So it's it's not that clear cut, but does that kind of answer that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So we have a question that was submitted via the chat box. We have an incident that goes viral and gains enough attention that we have violent demonstrations. Do we have a planned response? I can, I can start for a little bit. So let's hope that doesn't happen. Uh, I'll have some wood. Um, I don't. I don't know if you ever can plan for kind of some of the things that are going on, especially a department our size. So. The, to say a yes and no answer for that, one is our officers. In fact, we have a uh, training coming up for um, uh, field force training, I think that's what we call it, with the tactics and um, dealing with large groups or large um, groups up to mayhem. So part of the thing is equipment, and, uh, and that's something that um, I think is important to bring up too, is that Mission Police Department, if we had a situation that what we're seeing at the magnitude of some of these other cities, we're not staffed to handle those type of situations, nor are we equipped to, to handle those type of situations by ourselves. We'd be requiring assistance from outside agencies, Johnson County, Olathe, Lenexa, Shawnee. Some of these large agencies are going to have to bring the personnel to help us deal with that. So um, do we have a plan? Yeah, reach out for help. Um, and our officers are trained to deal with their assignment, but uh, it would be it would be coordinating on a larger scale with our with our uh, neighboring agencies in the county to help us facilitate and deal with a situation at that magnitude. Kevin, Matt. So, and and there is a regional response plan as well um, that covers uh, you know the metropolitan area and it deals with equipment and and those types of things that smaller agencies just don't have um, if it were to come to that. You know, we, don't, we don't want that here. We want to keep talking and making progress. Uh, the other thing is we, we do some pre-planning and some you know, tabletop type discussions over some of these issues that we see uh, as they come up in current events. And so there's there's kind of checklists that we have that kind of discuss some of the things that um, as as we as we review kind of what other agencies have gone through, things you know kind of lessons lessons learned. And we don't do that just for you know a response to a to a civil unrest or a riot or whatever terminology it is. Uh, we do that for a wide variety of events. So. We want to make sure that we're prepared as best we can to, uh, to deal with any situation that might come up. And I would just add from my perspective, I can attest that over the last couple of months, we've had um, an ongoing conversation. Uh, tabletop exercise is one way to look at it, but we're, we've been really as as an organization, as leadership in the police department and, and in the city looking at 
what is occurring nationally, what is occurring regionally, what is occurring locally, and talking about that very specifically and what our response would be and planning for that response, but talking about that in terms of a response that aligns with the values of our community and of our city council. So, um, do we have a written action plan? No, but we have spent hours and hours and hours talking um, through those issues uh, and planning and preparing and, and we've engaged in conversation um, within the county uh, with some of our neighboring communities who you know, have been um, handling and navigating and, and negotiating some of these situations. So it's important for us um, to, to think ahead and to plan, but to also do that in a way that is reflective of who we are as a community. Oh, Anna Leary, did you want, to, I believe, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yes, thank you. Um, and I want to apologize ahead of time because I have a couple pages of notes and I'm trying to distill it down into the smallest quantity that I can. Um, I want to really quick piggyback on what you just were discussing. I think as a, as a resident, um, as somebody who lives in these neighborhoods, I think the policy that I'd like you to have is what is your attitude going to be towards people who are exercising their right to assemble? Uh, and, and, you know, do you feel you need to have a heavy hand in that situation or do you feel that you can just watch it unfold? I mean, hopefully those are the conversations you're having. Um, I, I know the National Guard is here to help us. I'm not worried about those big events. I'm worried about those neighborhood events a la Overland Park. Um, I think the thing that sticks in my brain when, I, when you share these things with me and I appreciate that you share these things with me is your policies tend to have that line stuck in them when you're using force where it is the officer's um, kind of opinion about it, it's your officer, the officer su suspects this may happen and you become the judge and the jury and things happen and unfold quickly and so that's the language that I'd like you as a city to consider. I know it's the hardest language to get through, but that's the language that scares me because so many of these officers think they're doing the right thing and there's no balance to their decision. So um, how do we find that balance? Um, I have a couple questions specifically, what is Mission doing to foster inclusivity in the police department? Um, how do you ever compare your trainings? Do you ha look at how many use of force trainings you have compared to the mental health trainings, compared to the community building, compared to de-escalation trainings? Are they similar? Do you do more of one and less of another? Um, and I think that's really my big question right now. Thank you. I'll answer some of that if I, if I may. Um, thank you. Um, good questions on, on all fronts. Um, one of the things as far as the training aspect goes is, again, our, our instructors, I'm not the only one, I, I'm trying to train the younger officers into that. They're always up at the academy training and making sure that we're, uh, and that's every department in Johnson County um, that sends their officers to the Regional Police Academy, they're, they're instructing. So what is being taught out there to the officers, our officers are, are teaching and reinforcing out there as well. Uh, I also started a, a defensive, uh, we call them use of force or defensive tactics and structures group that meet, uh, uh, we did before COVID hit, once a month um, and talk about topics and, and, and techniques and training techniques. And we also share when we're going to train and it's an open invite for us to go to other departments and train for them to come here and train. So we're all training together. So um, everybody's following the same use of force plan. There is no, um, there may be a department, as mentioned earlier, that allow carotid neck, neck restraint. Uh, we don't, so our officers obviously will use that in the training scenarios that they're given. But, uh, you know, they're, we're retrained together frequently and uh, on the same topics. Can you talk about what the crisis intervention team uh, training is? How many hours is that class? I think that's a week long. It's a, you know, I think it's a 40-hour class, so 
if our officers go through uh, you know a crisis intervention training class, they're getting a significant portion of their training that year is to deal with with those types of situations, as opposed to the you know potentially eight to twelve hours a year they're getting for uh, defensive tactics and firearms and things like that. So you know those. The percentages, in, and they vary. They vary by year as far as, you know, if one officer goes to a specific training that's for defensive tactics, they're, they're going to vary uh, heavy on, on that end for the year. So, But I think with the constant training that we send our officers to for crisis intervention, uh, that, you know, that's reinforced uh, through our interaction with Johnson County Mental Health co-responders co and, and those programs as well. Can you answer the question that she asked about the First Amendment rights, right to protest and uh, how that's handled? I'm sure. We, we've had, um, I don't know how many, um, several I would say that that come up and advise us that they're going to be standing on the sidewalk and, and had one with the post office, which was actually one just recently, uh, and they said that they were going to be up there handing out flyers that was in support of the post office. Um, but again, no different than if they weren't in support of the post office. Um, we're supportive of those things. And there's the guidelines of, you know, um, you're not impeding people's uh, the traffic, you're not impeding people's in or out of the business uh, and it's been since I've been in mission I haven't witnessed anything that um, that was ever a problem of people wanting to do peaceful protests around around our city and we do encourage that and, and that's it's no problem for us at all I think uh, we have another comment from Ann O'Leary um, have you considered putting any de-escalation tactics on your defensive action report? I would like de-escalation use or non-use to carry some weight in your policing. Good. It's a good question. So de-escalation um, is, is, is using your verbal skills instead of having to talk to them and use uh, or using physical skills to control the, the person. And as you can see, one of the very first things is, is that there in the defensive action report is that there's the officer presence who shows up on the scene. So he's establishing control of the scene. The next thing is verbal direction. That is verbal direction is to de-escalate whatever that person is doing to cause the behavior to escalate. So when you're put in a situation, um, if I come in there and that person is holding a baseball bat, um, I'm, I'm going to immediately start using verbal commands to that person to put the baseball bat down. And so you get that repetition and de-escalation is what I consider of stop doing whatever you're doing so I don't have to use this next level of force. Um, is that verbal communication back and forth between you and the suspect? I think that uh, one of Ian's questions also was what are we doing to improve inclusivity? Uh, I think it's fair that we would all probably answer that question that we haven't been as intentional as we need to be uh, in that respect, and that's one of the things that we're talking a lot about. Um, and, and so we have some grounds, I think, to make up in terms of what are the appropriate steps and, and what, what works uh, in helping us achieve goals of greater inclusivity. I know just um, since our conversations have started, we've at really all levels of the staff have been exploring a variety of training opportunities uh, and resources um, primarily here locally um, so that we can start to build in. I think um, we've had you know, pretty extensive conversations around um, bringing implicit bias training and this is actually part of the, the multi-step action plan that we look at ways to improve the implicit bias training not only for the officers in the police department, but for the city council uh, and all of the employees uh, throughout the organization. Uh, but we also recognize that we, we can't jump into uh, expecting everybody to be able to answer, be comfortable answering our questions and participating when um, it's, they haven't necessarily been a part of that. And so we are certainly open both in these conversations 
uh, you know, via our virtual meetings, offline, individually, in whatever way you have questions or would like to reach out and share information uh, with us. We want to create as many opportunities and open to your suggestions on how we can do a better job of opening up those lines of communication. There's a question in the chat um, about is there a contact you can reach out to after the meeting to share a comment and content suggestions for our next meeting. I was actually thinking that we could add something to the website, like a form potentially. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I think we can certainly add a form to the website. Um, I will put my email, well, if I'm smart enough to do it. Here now, but let's let's do that. Uh, Captain Madden or uh, Captain Lane, can you talk a little bit about the diversity on the work on the uh, police force? Because I do know you have uh, a diverse workforce. It, it may not be uh, as diverse as we'd like it, but I know you have some Hispanic. Uh, and uh, African-American uh, members of the police force and other uh, diverse uh, members. So could you go over that, please? Yeah, we have um, a couple of Hispanic males, I believe we have two Hispanic males. We have a white female and we have an African-American male currently right now. Um, it's one thing that, um, you know, we always, we have no control over who or, or, or what sex applies for, with us. Um, and that is something that's not on the application and it's not allowed to be on the application when, it, when we get applications. So um, what I'm really proud of right now is what we're doing is the word of mouth um, of, of getting good officers to our agency. Um, one of our most recent ones was a, was a uh, six-year veteran from a larger agency in the Metro um, who happened to be a Hispanic male. Um, and, and it's it's about getting those good people here, um, and I, I would love to have the diversity. It's just um, when we get the applicants, it's absolutely uh, is our is our goal. It's just trying to get um, the best people to come over here. Thank you. Well, there are questions. I mean, I know we didn't go through all the policies line by line, but if anyone has, um, you know, specific questions on any of the policies. Okay. Next question. Uh, yes, and just very quickly, what I wanted to touch on, so um, we, there was a packet on the website that was distributed uh, Friday. That packet was updated just prior to the seasonings meeting. And it includes a copy of the full PowerPoint presentation that we walked through on the screen. It also includes some additional handouts. Uh, we pulled some of the use of force um, and, and bias-based statistics uh, charts and graphs out so they be, become easier to read in, in our individual handouts. I also included a table of contents for the full lexical manual, as I mentioned at the outset. Um, there are over 101 policies. So uh, we picked out you know, several where we've had a lot of conversation, but certainly as you look through the table of contents, there are other policies that you would uh, like for us to pull in and provide, we can certainly um, do that. So in terms of next steps and upcoming meetings, we were scheduled um, tonight to really take that look at what, what policies what are we using to manage our policies? What policies? What do the policies say currently? How are we training on those policies? And then kind of where, where, are, the, where are the statistics today? Excuse me. Our next meeting, the next step in the action plan is a meeting for next Wednesday evening, so September 2nd. It will be part of our Finance and Administration Committee meeting. Um, don't have a specific start time for that meeting, but we'll, it will be immediately following the conclusion of community development, which begins at 6.30. Um, and the focus uh, for next week's meeting is on, as I think I mentioned before, kind of more along the lines of accountability. So 
what do we look at? What are the things that we consider? What are our processes um, for hiring officers? So how are they vetted? Um, how do we train? What are the more specific training requirements in some areas? We're going to talk about internal affairs and that process, and we'll talk about the number of internal affairs complaints that we've had and the type of internal affairs complaints that we've had. So there's a um, sharing some information in that process. We'll talk more about, uh, again, the citizen, the options, and what other agencies or communities are doing in terms of citizen review boards. Yeah, we'll talk about, um, I'm looking at you because we haven't said this for a while, but I think we're going to talk about Giglio. So write some Giglio considerations and, as well as um, C-Posts and the officer certification and how um, those things are managed uh, from the state level in terms of maintaining officer certification. Laura? Yes. Um, one thing that I think would be helpful, and I don't know if you want to do it tonight or, or next time, uh, it would be helpful to know the impact of the last three months and the incidents that have taken place outside of our community have impacted the actual work of the police officers on the ground in terms of interaction with the citizens. Have there been issues that have come up that we should be aware of? Uh, is it increased uh, confrontational uh, issues with regards to traffic stops or anything like that in relationship to what's going on in our current environment? I think that is an extremely difficult question to answer given the other circumstances we're dealing with uh, with COVID. So a lot of our contacts uh, you know, are down significantly. Uh, we do hear anecdotally about officers uh, getting waved at with a single finger on numerous occasions, or you know, the comments made to them when they go inside of a of a restaurant or quick trip or whatever the case may be. But you know, for the most part, this community supports us. Um, we feel appreciated. Uh, it's important to us that. You know that we have that that relationship with the community because that's how we that's how we keep bad things from happening. Yeah, and I'll add to that. It, it is um, anytime you have a, a a national stage with with something that is um, anti law enforcement uh, or some negative context with law enforcement, it it, it 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 ripples all the way through, no matter where you're at, and and you are viewed in that view. Um, you know, it's unfortunate, but, um, you know, again, just for every person that's negative towards us, um, there, there's two more positive that are stepping in and, and, and trying to help out. And, and that's, and it's good. And I, and I think it really the communication that, that's going on in our city, the conversations that are happening in our city um, is, is boosting a little bit of the morale with our folks to know that, you know, we're, we're going down the right road, we're trying to do the right things, and we're trying to be transparent uh, all the way around and communicate, um, which I think is leading us down the paths that we're, we're going today and, and taking us to where we need to be tomorrow. Laura, I have a quick follow-up question, if, if you don't mind. Um, and it's more of a, a comment, but, um, you know, to follow up um, on our officers, I think, we would be remiss not to, at some point in these conversations, talk about the history the Mission Police Department has um, in the community and the work that um, Chief Hadley has done over the f past five years to really rebuild um, that relationship. I think um, we all are well aware of um, the reputation that we had for a long time of don't drive through Mission, you'll get stopped, um, you'll get a ticket. And I, I think it would serve us well to um, you know, look at that history, how far back we go, I'm not sure, but I think, um, you know, touching on a little bit of that at some point in these conversations would, would be helpful for me. Sure. And I'll just expand a little bit. So next week, again, is um, kind of the systems and structures which help uh, build in accountability uh, over the lifespan um, of an officer 
and then in October we really move more toward, and we don't have the date set in October yet, I think we're still hopeful that we might be able to um, find a way to comfortably meet in, in person for this next, um, what's really more of, intended to be more of a community dialogue. So once we have kind of an understanding, um, you know, how do we start to move into uh, really what the important conversations are, and that is, you know, here's where we are. Um, are there areas for us to improve uh, things that we need to listen and hear and understand more about uh, throughout the community? And then again, continuing um, that conversation going forward. Again, I don't think we're not approaching this as one point in time, one conversation in time. Um, this just becomes part of our ongoing review and analysis of the department. And, and I think we failed to mention, so the, the statistics in many ways that we reported this evening, um, you know, we've kept those. We haven't, like most other agencies, um, reported those on a regular basis to the public. That will be our intent and what we will do going forward. And so we'll talk, as we kind of refine those, what is the appropriate frequency uh, and how do we share those so that going forward it's not it's not a secret. So we'll pull back the curtain and, and look. And I will tell you, I think just in kind of what we've put together, I haven't seen um, many of the other communities going to some of the level of detail that we have, particularly as it relates to use of force uh, in terms of identifying the type of force. But I, we felt in our conversations that that's an important piece of that to really understand and help to illustrate you know, those training opportunities for for all of that. So the reporting and the ongoing reporting is going to be another piece um, that we'll continue to bring to you and to the community. Laura? This, yes. Laura, this is Wandra and uh, Wandra Minor, and I'd like to know if it's possible to get a hard copy of the presentation from tonight. Absolutely. We can okay. either, would you like me to put that in the mail to you, or would you like to stop by City Hall and pick that up? What's your preference? Um, I can stop and uh, pick that up. Uh, okay. Next, uh, what day, which is come, uh, the soonest I could stop by? You can pick it up at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. Anytime oh. after 8 after eight a.m. tomorrow morning, it will be ready and available for you. How about oh. that? Oh, that's wonderful. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, I know we are at just slightly past 8.30, and we actually moved through this more quickly than I thought we might. Um, so certainly, do we, do we want to take a break? Are we finished for this evening? Other things we want to have conversation around, certainly open to that. Um, hey, Laura, this is Nick. I, I guess I did have one more question, it's kind of going back to some of the um, police policy stuff. I know there was a mention of some excited delirium or some, some policies that maybe came out of some excited delirium stuff in the past. Do we have anything specific in our policies in dealing with a case of expected uh, excited delirium? We don't have. Uh, can you repeat the question because I can. Yeah. And you're asking if we have a specific policy for excited delirium? Is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah, or specific guidelines on how to respond. I know Lexapol has posted some, some uh, I guess, best practices on that. I didn't know if we had anything else above and beyond that within our policies. No, sir, there's nothing specific on that. And, and part of that is, is, is talking about where, we, where the, the trend was, where you're seeing um, more uh, where you saw the excited delirium deaths were in use of force situations. So it's addressed in our use of force policy. It's best, it's best to be fitted there. Um, our officers do attend training to, to pick up signs and cues of someone having um, dealing with that uh, or dealing with someone who's, who's experiencing excited delirium um, episode. Uh, but there is not a specific policy as you could imagine if we try to figure out or put a policy for every one of those type of, it would get pretty lengthy. 
but it is it mentioned in our in our use of force and and part of the the biggest thing was people being placed on their stomachs for long periods of time and that's where you were seeing the deaths from excited delirium or over uh, uh, heat exhaustion or, or heat related deaths all right thank you Anything else? Yes, I just wanted to say, Laura, that I think this is a fantastic process. This is day one of at least two more conversations that we're going to have about this. And as you mentioned, this is going to be an ongoing conversation. This is going to be a, um, a moving fluid thing where we are going to have to talk about this, not just at a point in time, but over time as, as the world changes. Um, I think it's a great process. I appreciate everybody's participation. Um, I look forward to our next conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your time this evening and we'll hope you'll tune back in next Wednesday for round two. All right, thank you all. Thanks everyone.